All right. In this practice quiz, it looks like we are launching a rocket. We know the total mass, four kilograms, or at least the mass of the rocket itself. We're loading it with 2.4 kilograms of fuel and 0.64 kilograms of oxygen. And we're assuming that half of that fuel is consumed by the time it reaches 30 meters. And we also know we've got an air resistance force and also we're losing some heat. And we know that uh, the fuel and the oxygen are reacting to create some reactant products. <clears throat> we know how much energy change is involved in that. And that's what's powering the rise of the rocket. So let's start by, if we want to figure out, uh, I mean, looking ahead a little bit, it looks like the, what we're trying to do is draw out an energy interaction diagram for everything that's changing and also eventually finding the speed of the rocket when it reaches that 30 meter mark. So we wanna figure out how fast is it going as it's on its way up at the 30 meter mark. So it strikes me that probably a good way to start this would be to just list out everything we know about the initial conditions and the final conditions so we can figure out what kinds of energy are changing. And just based on what's described here, what types of energy should we be keeping track of, do you think? Yeah, we definitely have potential energy of gravity because it's changing its height. And yeah, kinetic energy because it's changing its speed. <clears throat> so we know we're going to involve uh, those values. Kinetic energy because of its speed. Potential energy, specifically what kind of potential energy? Oh, somebody mentioned earlier gravity, yeah because its height is changing. And uh, chemical or bond energy, is anything changing phase here? Like, are we melting or boiling or anything like that? Yeah, we are changing uh, the types of molecules in here. We've got a chemical reaction going on so we have, uh, it's sometimes called bond energy. I usually think of it as chemical energy in, in the sense that we're talking about bonds within the molecules changing what kinds of molecules we're dealing with. Yeah, the reactants turning into the products. It's not uh, physical bond energy in the sense of a phase change. It's chemical bond energy in the sense of the molecules are changing what kind of molecules there are. So we've got chemical energy or chemical bond energy. I usually call that E chemical to distinguish it from physical bond energy but it is technically a type of bond energy. And formally we could say the, the, uh, the number of moles is the, uh, the indicator here. And specifically it's talking about delta H per mole of X. So I would say number of moles of X here as the indicator. <clears throat> and is anything else changing? We've got the height change, the speed change. Seems like that's about it, right? And uh, would you consider this, yeah, energy is leaving the system. How do we know that? What here tells us this is an open system with energy leaving? Yeah, we've got air resistance, which is work being done to remove energy from the system and also heat loss. So both of those are energies leaving the system. So we should definitely treat this as an open system with energy leaving the system in the form of both work and heat. So we've got heat leaving the system and also work leaving the system. <clears throat> 
work in the form of air resistance because air resistance is a force on a moving object. Any questions on that so far? And it tells us the heat. Heat is, we're losing 2000 joules of heat. So we'll write that as negative 2000. And as for work, how do we calculate how much work is leaving the system here? Do you have a formula for work? Uh, e chemical is the chemical bond energy of the associated with the chemical reaction going on here. That as the fuel and oxidizer are burned, they release energy. Uh, sometimes also called bond energy. I usually call it chemical energy to distinguish from the physical bond energy. But the physical bond energy and chemical bond energy are both types of bond energy. Uh, yeah, we can calculate work as force times distance, at least average force times distance. And it tells us the average force is 100 newtons. So 100 newtons times uh, how, much, how much distance is it traveling? Right, 30 meters. So we got the average force of 100 newtons times 30 meters. <clears throat> and should we treat that as positive or negative? Yeah, that should be negative. It is work leaving the system that is it, it's causing the rocket to have less energy than it would otherwise. So that counts as negative. You can even see that mathematically if you look at the directions. The delta y, the, the motion of the rocket is upwards. But the force of air resistance acts against that. The force of air resistance would be downwards. So we could treat delta y as a positive 30 meters and the average force as negative 100 newtons in terms of direction. So multiply a negative times a positive, you get a negative. So that is the work done. Work is negative 3,000 joules. <clears throat> Any questions on those so far? And just in terms of the directions of each of these, would you say kinetic energy is increasing or decreasing over the course of this time interval? Yeah, we've got an increase in kinetic energy because the rocket is getting faster. And it starts at speed zero, ends at some non-zero positive speed. Uh, what about its potential energy of gravity? Yeah, increasing potential energy because it ends at a higher height than it started at. In fact, we even know the initial height and final height, zero and 30. We could fill those in in the diagram as well. You could say y initial equals zero meters, y final equals 30 meters. And same for the speed. We could say we start with uh, initial speed is zero meters per second, the final is unknown. That's ultimately what we're trying to find. And what about the chemical energy here? Is the chemical energy of this reaction an increase or decrease in chemical energy? Yeah, that's got to be a decrease. And we really have two things going on here. If you take a close look at the chemicals, uh, if you look at each, each reactant and each product, We're consuming fuel X and oxygen. We're producing reactants Y oxide and water. And if you're consuming reactants, you are breaking bonds. So what, what does that involve an increase or decrease in energy? Yeah, breaking bonds involves an increase in bond energy. You have to add energy to break them apart. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
But when you're also forming these products, that's creating bonds. So what kind of change in energy does that involve? Yeah, forming bonds involves a decrease in energy. The molecules, are, the atoms are moving around. You have to remove energy to allow them to condense into bonded form. And overall, would you expect the increases or decreases to be the larger ones? Yeah, overall, this should be a decrease. This process presumably involves a small increase in bond energy, chemical bond energy, and a large decrease in chemical bond energy. And the reason is, if it was the other way around, we wouldn't be using this as a fuel. The whole point of a fuel is that it involves a small increase in bond energy to get the reaction started, but a larger decrease in bond energy as the products form. That way, the extra energy is released as heat or whatever you're using the fuel for. So in general, if something is useful as a fuel, that's because the overall change in chemical energy is a decrease. So overall, we can assume that chemical energy decreases. And our indicator here, number of moles of X, over the course of this reaction, are we gaining X or losing X? Yeah, we are losing, we are consuming X in the reaction. So we're losing molecules of X. I think we can even take a look at how much we start with and how much we end with. Does this say anything about how much fuel we start with? Yeah, we've got 2.4 kilograms of fuel. <clears throat> and yeah, we're, we're using half of that. So we're using 1.2 kilograms. And we'll have to convert that to moles because we don't have anything about energy per kilogram, but we do have energy per mole of X. So how would we convert uh, 2.4 kilograms of fuel into moles of fuel? Yeah, using the molar mass as shown right here, 120 grams per mole. We can just do this, do this as a, a conversion factor. Or you could write that as, let's say we call this 2,400 grams, since kilo just means times 1,000. 2,400 grams, and should we multiply or divide by 120 here? Yeah, we should divide because we want to cancel out grams. So if we divide by 120 grams per mole, grams cancels out and we end up with divided by divided by moles. So that's just moles. So that equals 2,400 over 120. One of the zeros cancels out. 240 over 12 should just be 20. So we start with 20 moles of fuel. And we know we use half of it. So we should end with 10 moles of fuel left over. <clears throat> so I think that's all the information we need for our energy interaction diagram. And then we could even write this out as an equation. We could say all these changes add up to heat plus work. And we could assign a positive or negative sign to each one of those. We know we've got an increase in chemical and kinetic energy, an increase in potential energy or gravity, a decrease in chemical energy. And we also know heat and work are both negative here because they're leaving the system. Any questions on that so far? I'm sorry, could you explain again about what the small, the parentheses in pink next to the reactants and products mean? Uh, small yeah. Small and large? In the sense that uh, when we're breaking bonds, like breaking bonds of X, the fuel, breaking bonds of oxygen, uh, that's, a, only a, that's an increase in energy because you have to add energy to break the bonds. But it's only a small amount of increase. These are unstable molecules, so it's easy to break the bonds. <clears throat> 
then when the new products form, when the atoms recombine into Y oxide and water, that's a decrease in bond energy and chemical bond energy because it's a it's forming bonds. Forming bonds means energy is decreasing because a bond has a negative amount of energy. And presumably that's a large decrease in energy. Presumably Y oxide and water are very stable chemical arrangements. So you have to add a little bit of energy to break apart the original molecules, but remove a lot of energy to allow the new molecules to form because they're more stable. So overall, this involves a decrease in chemical energy. Okay, just to reiterate, basically we are looking at the bond energies and depending on if you're breaking bonds, you are increasing your chemical, your bond energy decrease. Creating bonds is creating your bond energy. And depending on how stable the compounds are, that indicates if it's going to be a small or a large amount of yeah. the shift in energy. Right. And in general, okay, anything cool. that Thank can you. be used as a fuel, uh, the reaction over the, the like combustion reactions overall are going to be overall a decrease in chemical bond energy, which is why it's useful as a fuel in the first place. If the overall reaction involved an increase in energy, then it wouldn't be useful as a reaction, right? As it wouldn't be useful as a fuel. You'd have to add energy to make it work rather than getting energy out of it. Uh, is E chemical the same as E bond? It's a type of bond energy. I, I, I like to distinguish between physical bond energy, like if you're changing the phase of the substance from solid to liquid or whatever, versus chemical bond energy, if you're actually changing what types of molecules are involved. They can both be considered bond energies. It's just that they're different kinds of bonds we're dealing with. And will force of air resistance for friction always be negative? Not necessarily. Uh, forces of, for force, whether it's positive or negative depends on the direction. Uh, in terms of work, whether it's positive or negative depends on are you adding energy to the system or removing energy for the system, from the system. <clears throat> for example, if you're trying to move an object really fast through, through the air, the air is pushing back against you. So that means air resistance would cause a negative amount of work. It's removing energy from the system. But on the other hand, let's say there's a lot of wind and you're using wind to push a sailboat, for example. In that case, the force of the wind on the sail would create a positive amount of work because it's, it's adding energy to the system. The wind is making it get faster and faster. So that would be air causing a positive amount of work. Or for friction, for instance, if you've got something coasting and sliding on the ground, friction's trying to slow it down. So that would be friction doing a negative amount of work. But on the other hand, if you've got powered wheels, like for a car, if you've got a car powering its wheels to go forward, or even if you're just walking forward, you're using friction with the ground to propel yourself forward. So in that case, friction would be doing a positive amount of work because it's acting with the motion of the object. It's acting to increase the kinetic energy. Any other questions on that setup so far? Okay, then let's see if we can turn this in this equation into uh, into some useful numbers. A little space here. And let me just copy over this whole equation. We can fill in some formulas here. If we just fill in the usual formulas for kinetic energy, for instance, we've got half the mass times delta speed squared. And then for potential energy of gravity, we can use our usual mass times gravity times delta y. And then chemical energy, how would we calculate change in chemical energy here? <clears throat> yeah, we could use delta N times delta H. Because we know the, and really the delta H is it's listed as energy per mole of X. So we know how much the number of moles of X changes, and we know the delta H. So we can just multiply those together to get moles and moles to cancel out and end up with joules. 
and we know the amount of heat, we know the amount of work, so we can just fill those values in directly. <coughs> and filling in final minus initial, the final squared minus the initial squared, and then y final minus y initial, and final number of moles of x minus initial number of moles of x. And uh, do we know anything, before we even fill in any specific numbers, do we know if any of these are going to be zero? Are any of these initial or final values zero? Yeah, we know it starts at height zero and speed zero. So let's fill those in first. It starts off at zero height and zero speed. The rocket does. So simplifying that a little bit, we just have m over two times v final squared plus m times g times y final, which we know, plus n final minus n initial, which is just going to be 10 minus 20 times delta h equals heat plus work. And of these, what are we actually trying to solve for? What's our goal here? Yeah, we want to find V final. So before we even fill in any other numbers, and I, I would go ahead and fill in the zeros just because filling in zeros makes it significantly easier to work with. But before we fill in the rest of the numbers, I would recommend solving for V final algebraically and then plug in the numbers at the very end. So how would you isolate V final here? <clears throat> we're going to have to be careful about delta n, delta h, because we know overall we know delta e chemical should be what kind of what kind of uh, value here. Let's go ahead and fill in some numbers for that temporarily. Yeah, we know delta e chemical should be negative overall. If we fill in the values temporarily, n final minus n initial, that's ten moles minus twenty moles, so that'll be negative ten moles in the sense that over the course of this reaction, we are losing 10 moles of fuel X. And what's delta H here? Yeah, delta H is listed as negative 700 joules per mole. So if we multiply those together, what kind of number do we get? Positive, but it should be negative. That makes me think that this is the delta H is listed wrong. The delta H should really be listed as positive 700. Either that or they're using a different convention where delta N, where it should be negative delta N delta H. <clears throat> but I think it would probably be more useful. Uh, it's chemical bond energy. I mean, it is a form of bond energy in the sense that we are breaking and forming bonds. But I would call it chemical energy just to avoid confusion with the physical bond energy. Because it's not like we're going through a phase change here. We are going through changes in the type of molecules involved. Strictly speaking, you should never have to manually input the sign. If you're talking about physical bond energy, if you're always looking at the uh, final minus initial mass of the higher energy state, like if you're always using gas, if it's talking about gas, or using liquid, if you're talking about solid and liquid, if you're always using the mass of the higher energy state as your indicator, then uh, the positive or negative will already be built in. And here, X is higher energy than the, 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 pro the uh, the reactants are higher energy than the products in the sense that they're unstable. Fuel is higher energy than exhaust. So X is the higher energy compound here. And if you're always using the mass of the higher energy state, the positive or negative sign will always show up automatically. I don't know why they're saying fill it in manually. That's not necessary as long as you're careful to always use the higher energy state. <clears throat> 
I mean, certainly you should be checking it. Does this show up as the sign that I expect it to be? <clears throat> but as long as you're using the mass of the higher energy state as the indicator, it will always automatically show up with the right sign. Uh, in this case, I think it would be more accurate to list the delta H as positive. So let's say this is positive 700 joules per mole. And that gives us the right sign, the negative sign. But is, in terms of whether you should be adding or subtracting, you're always adding up the delta energies. The, the definition of the conservation of energy equation is you're adding the delta energies and setting that equal to zero if it's a closed system or heat plus work if it's an open system. But you'd never be subtracting delta energies. You're always adding up delta energies and setting it equal to heat plus work. It's just that some of those delta energies might happen to be negative numbers. But in this case, it looks like as long as we're treating delta H as a positive number, then we can just take the delta N, final amount of X minus initial amount of X times that delta H, and that will give us the correct sign. So definitely check to make sure the process you're using will give you the correct sign. But as long as you set up the delta correctly, then the correct sign should show up automatically. Just make sure you're setting it up in such a way that it will. Any other questions on that so far? All right, then let's see if we can solve this. Uh, knowing that this ends up being negative 7,000 joules from the 10 times 700, let's fill in, actually, before we plug in any more numbers, how would you isolate V final here? What steps could you take to solve for V final? If delta H were positive, um, no, because we're taking delta N as a negative number. Delta N is negative 10 moles. So negative 10 moles times positive 700 joules per mole equals a negative value, meaning a net decrease in energy. Unless we're using a formula like, if we say delta E chemical it is negative delta N times delta H. If we write it like that, then we would use a negative value for delta H. So I think it really just depends on which sign conventions you're using. And I think that there may be different sign conventions for chemistry versus physics. Uh, but either way, check to make sure you're setting it up in such a way that it's going to produce the correct sign. And yeah, if we shift things around to the other side of the equation, let's say uh, we want to subtract the MGY final and subtract the N final minus N initial from both sides. And let's see what that gives us. And yeah, uh, multiply both sides by two, divide both sides by M. And then take the square root to cancel out that squared. So what we've done here, before we even plug in any numbers other than the zeros, we now have, instead of just a single number, we now have a formula for the results. And at this point, we can start plugging in some values. We might want to simplify first. We've got heat plus work. And those are both multiplied by 2 over m. Or we could just multiply by the 2 over m at the end, actually. That might be easier. But if we start filling in some values, we've got square root of, we know heat and work. So we've got 
negative 2,000 joules plus negative 3,000 joules is negative 5,000 joules minus mg y final. And now we need to figure out what numbers to use here. When we're talking about potential energy, what should we use for the mass? Or how do we decide what mass to use? Four kilograms was the mass of the rocket alone, but what else is the rocket carrying with it? Fuel, and also oxygen as well. So, and yeah, we should use the rocket plus the final fuel mass because it uses up some of the fuel. It uses half of its fuel. And where does the expended fuel end up? Yeah, it ends up on the ground. So the, the fuel that we're going to expend, the other half of the fuel, starts off at ground level at rest and ends up at ground level at rest. So we don't need to worry about that as, as in terms of changes in potential and kinetic energy. We can look at just the rocket and the fuel that hasn't been burned yet and the oxidizer that hasn't been burned yet. So in terms of the rocket itself, the mass that's actually moving is the rocket mass plus the mass of half of the fuel, 2.4, half of that would be 1.2 kilograms, plus half of the oxidizer, which would be 0.32 kilograms. So that's the mass of the rocket, the fuel, and the O2, because we're burning half of it. So four kilograms plus 1.2 would be, uh, should definitely include the O2, because that does have mass. Yeah, because we the rocket is carrying that oxygen with it. It's not just pulling in oxygen from the air around it. The oxygen is loaded into the rocket. And if we're consuming half of the fuel, I would expect we're, having, we're consuming half of the oxygen as well. Yeah, because according to the chemical equation, we're, we're consuming equal numbers of moles of X and oxygen. And we've got a total of, 20 moles of X. And also if you take a look at the conversions here, 20 moles of oxygen as well. So we would be using half the oxygen. So that's four plus 1.2 plus 0.32 would be 5.52. So that would be the mass then. And then gravity, uh, what are we using for gravity here? Yeah, 9.8 meters per second squared. And then Y final, it looks like it reaches a height of 30 meters. And then we also have N final minus N initial. So here we've got 20 minus, or 10 minus 20, 10 moles minus 20 moles is final minus initial amount of X will be negative 10. And then delta H was 700 joules per mole. So multiply those, negative 10 times 700, we're gonna get negative 7,000. So negative 7,000 joules of chemical bond energy. And then we're multiplying that whole thing by two over M. M again being the 5.52 kilograms. Get this out of the way. And I think that should do it then. Any questions on that so far? Initial mass different from final mass. Uh, yes, the rocket does start with 2.4 kilograms of fuel, but where does that, where does half of that fuel go? 
the rocket carries, yeah, before the launch, it might help to take a look at it this way. Before the launch, we've got the rocket. So we've got the rocket itself, and that's still there at the top. And that is uh, 2.4 kilograms. <clears throat> and then we've also got, what's the rocket carrying with it? Oh, sorry, that should be four kilograms. Let me change that. Yeah, the rocket's carrying 2.4 kilograms of fuel, but it's only going to spend how much of that fuel and how much of that oxygen. Right, only half of it. So we can split that up. We can think of that as we've got, if we think of this as two sections, we've got 1.2 kilograms of fuel and 0.32 kilograms of oxygen. So 1.2 plus 0.32 would be 1.52 kilograms of fuel and oxygen that's going to get used and 1.52 kilograms that's going to not get used. So the 1.52 kilograms that gets used ends up still on the ground. So for the mast, we're assuming that it's essentially just blowing it up at the beginning and not using it throughout, correct? Well, the thing is, the, the great thing about conservation of energy, all of these deltas only care about initial and final. Anytime you're dealing with delta anything, all that matters is the initial value and the final value. So the 1.52 kilograms of fuel to be burned, fuel and oxygizer to be burned. Uh, it starts off at ground level and it eventually ends up at ground level as well. So it, overall, it has not moved. It may have done some stuff in between, but all we care about is initially it's on the ground and at rest. Finally, it's on the ground and at rest. Whereas the 1.52 kilograms of fuel and oxygen that don't get burned, we could treat as payload. That's cargo that the rocket is carrying with it. And that's still there exactly as it was unchanged at the end. The rocket is still carrying that. Uh, oh yeah, the, the mass that I had in blue here, the four kilograms plus 1.2 kilograms plus 3.32 kilograms, that's just talking about uh, the stuff that's actually going up. This is 5.52 kilograms. This is 5.52 kilograms. So the, the payload we are definitely including. We've got four kilograms worth of rocket and 1.52 kilograms worth of payload that's going up with it. Since the 1.52 kilograms of payload doesn't change at all in terms of we're not losing or gaining any of it, it's traveling with the four kilogram rocket the whole time, we can treat the rocket and the payload essentially as one big object. So we essentially have a big 5.52 kilogram object that's going from at rest at ground level to high speed 30 meters up. Meanwhile, we also have 1.52 kilograms of fuel to be burned that ends up on the ground motionless. It starts on the ground, the 1.52 kilograms that starts on the ground motionless and ends on the ground motionless. So that overall has not changed its kinetic energy and potential energy at all. So for purposes of kinetic energy and potential energy, we only have to care about rocket with payload. Uh, we would include both the four kilogram rocket and the 1.52 kilogram payload. 
that's the 5.52 kilograms here and here in the equation. Because the what's actually moving around is a 5.52 kilogram object. The 1.52 kilograms of fuel to be burned, which turns into exhaust, that does not need to be included because for all practical purposes, it hasn't left the ground. In fact, we don't, we don't even know what happens in between. Maybe fuel is burned steadily as the rocket goes up, or maybe there's just one big bang at the bottom and that launches the rocket and no more fuel is burned after that. But the important thing is for purposes of all these deltas, it doesn't matter what happens in between. There's no, as far as the deltas are concerned, as far as the mathematics is concerned here, there is functionally no difference between burn all the fuel at once at ground level and let the rocket coast versus burn fuel slowly as you're on your way up. They're still gonna be treated exactly the same in terms of deltas, because for deltas, all that matters is this fuel starts off at ground level at rest and this fuel, the exhaust, ends at ground level at rest. So overall, it has gone through no change at all. But the 5.52 kilogram object that is rocket plus payload, that is the fuel and oxygen that don't get burned, that actually changes from ground level at rest to 30 meters up and traveling at some fast speed. We haven't solved for what's, actually we have solved for what final speed. We just haven't punched that into a calculator yet. But this mathematical expression, if you type it into a calculator, should give you the final speed of rocket plus payload. Any other questions on that one? All right, uh, then we'll take a look at uh, the spring potential energy stuff next time. Uh, oh, why didn't we use a chemical change in oxygen here? The, the thing is, we don't really need to keep track of all the individual reagents. The, 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 because technically we are, uh, X and the oxygen are gaining chemical energy and Y oxide and water are losing chemical and bond energy. But we can treat this, instead of treating it as the energy of each individual reactant, we can just take a look at the reaction as a whole because this delta H here is describing the whole reaction. It's not describing just individual components. It's telling us the energy we get from the whole reaction per mole of X that we use. And in some cases it might list the delta H separately for each component, but this delta H, since it's talking about the chemical equation has this delta H per mole of X, that presumably means the delta H for the entire chemical reaction, not just for one of the components of it. Any other questions on that? All right, you're welcome. See you next time.